All right, here we are. Welcome to Book Wave for a special Wavecast New Year's edition. I'm Scott, your host, joined by Pat, Man, and Will, as usual. And I have a special question for the audience and the both of you. What's your top of the hierarchy, number one, New Year's resolution for 2020 coming into this year? Start reading more. Yeah, just in general, just, uh, you know, reading more books and gradually reduce some old habits of mine that have been sticking to me for a long time and just learning more and just getting into that old habit of just learning and retaining all the information I've learned for fiction and nonfiction, learning about the different reading styles and just learn about what the author is presenting and see how much of an impact it has on me and what it has an impact on society in general. So how about both of you? Well, I was thinking that uh, I'm really going to start to take learning French seriously. So still along the same lines of learning and whatnot, but I'm going to focus on a brand new language. Yeah, that's actually something that I've been pondering as well. Because I mentioned before, like off air, that I need to brush up on Spanish. Mm -hmm. It would be a really good tool to have. And there's some other, there's some other creative projects that I like to work on as well. But that's for later. Yeah, and I was never really good at French in high school. So I figured I'd give it a better try. Because I keep thinking about that quote from Plato, how how he talks about forcing education upon a child doesn't work unless they want to actually learn about it. And this, this time I'm putting an honest effort forward to learn a new language. When did you start learning French? About a month ago. started like a Duolingo account. I'm on like a 40-day streak, something like that. So that's not going to be my only method for learning French. I'm going to try finding other stuff too. and You know, phil- philosophy debates in French couldn't hurt, right? <laughs> yeah, and Google and changing your language settings on your computer. Yeah, stuff like that. How about you, Will? Oh, how about me? Uh, what, resolutions? <laughs> Just get over this flu bug or what? <laughs> oh no, I'm just in holiday mode. There's this big metaphysical lever in my brain that is in off position right now. And I don't want to turn it on. <clears throat> I resolved to not resolve this year. I decided not to have New Year's resolutions. I do it every year. There's so many of them. You can decide to crap on yourself for the six weeks leading up to New Year's and the four weeks afterwards, going vegan and going to the gym and waking up early and learning a language and learning a skill and developing a hobby and expanding your spirituality and your emotional intelligence and communicating better and demanding what you want and all all of those things. You know what? Last year was really good for me. And I think I have the same goals going into 2020 as I did going into 2019, but I think I'm bringing with it a hell of a lot more clarity, focus, and data. And I think data is probably going to be the bigger focus going into this year is continuing to do what I've been doing, hopefully striving towards improving how I did it compared to yesterday and tracking it better because that's my biggest I don't want to say regret, but <clears throat> regret's probably the right word for it. Reflecting on 2019 is I didn't journal enough. I didn't track enough. I did a lot of journaling. I did a lot of tracking, but not enough that I can just look back and say, oh, that's how productive I was last January. That's how productive I was last February. That's where I went wrong in April. Because I think that's the most important part for me now. Like I, I know what I like to do. I know what I don't like to do. I'm starting to get a feel for who I am and what I want my days to look like. But it's a matter of being consistent and and stretching it out for the whole year. I think I had probably two four-month stretches last year where I was really kicking ass and I was really proud of myself. But it was that extra four months sprinkled in between. And I, I mean, I had a wedding and all sorts of things, but I'd like to do better this year I don't want to do different I don't want to do extraordinary I just want to do more and uh, balance balance is going to be the word for the year yeah me and Scott were off the air we were talking similar 
to that because I had this mentality of just keep going and not think so much about going back to square one because it's a new year. We're back at the first month of the year in January. It's all about just taking a short amount of time of reflecting and then keep moving forward towards what you want to do, doing more, learning a new skill and everything. Even if you have completed the grand quest of your life and you've explored different parts of the world, you have to stop and tell yourself that there's going to be a lot more coming at you and you have to find the resources available to keep trekking. It is good to reflect on what you've accomplished and you can have that that holiday season where you can spend time with friends and family and just get together and tell them what you've done for the year and going back to the going back to the great moments of your life but eventually your job as a human is to keep going and just remember what your true purpose is and i've been kind of reflecting on that lately and it's given me a boost too so that's one thing to keep in mind in fact uh for like right before the new year started i picked up some books for Christmas during the Christmas holiday. And one of those books is Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. And I read that in about two days. And holy crap. <laughs> holy crap, that is a punch to the face. Like, seriously. If you, if you ever know who David Goggins is, or if you're curious about what he is, what he thinks, what he writes about, um... I'm just surprised at how he thinks. Not just because, you know, he's a retired U.S. Navy SEAL, a U.S. Army Ranger. He can pull off these physical feats and break records and everything. It's all about the mentality, and he goes in-depth into that. And building mental toughness. And that got me thinking, maybe it's better to keep pushing yourself even if you don't want to. And these New Year's resolutions, a lot of people say that they're going to do so. Like they have this long list of resolutions they like to do and everything. And yet most of the time they just quit even after the first day or so. But going back to what I've read in David Goggins' book, it just gave me that drive to keep going. I guess that's a reason to keep moving forward and everything. I mean, it's self-explanatory and I'm just, you know, repeating myself lately. Apologies. Yeah. That's why I think it's kind of useful to have like a, instead of a big list of new year's resolutions that are just feel like a daunting task that you can't keep up with. Just pick one major thing that you want to focus on and then just let all the others kind of take care of themselves. Or just take care of one thing first and then go to the second thing. Gotta, because, you'll have an, because you'll have enough time to cover the others. Yeah, just got to set them up in a proper hierarchy. So what were your so, uh, favorite books that you read in 2019? One or two examples from each of you. Number one on the list. Oh, I don't know. It's a tie. First place goes to two winners, Atlas Shrugged and The Alchemist stated in no particular order because they were both gold for completely different reasons. I think for me, it, it had to be the first book of the year, which was Meditations, because that was, that was the one book that we all started to read for the first month of 2019. And, or excuse me, not first month. I think it was back in March or something. I don't recall. But anyway, it's the one book where we all got together and just talked through each chapter. And we got a number of people to join us and tell us their thoughts about Marcus Aurelius's philosophy of life and how to live by it. And eventually that expanded even further where we continue to show up each week and discuss more. 
And that was that was really good. I really enjoyed that. It it definitely got me into reading more books. I enjoyed the language that Aurelius put together. And I guess the second book would have to be The Alchemist, too. I mean, that's another another short tale. It's one of those books you have to put on your list if you are like an entrepreneur or if you're just just an individual striving to put together your ultimate purpose and going after that one dream that you developed for so many years and just going after it. Yeah, my answer was going to be uh, meditations as well, number one. And uh, number two would be The Three-Body Problem, which is the start of a science fiction trilogy that I've really been enjoying lately. I'm reading the second one right now, and it's like I, I can't talk about it because it'd just be all spoilers and it would take over the full episode, but anybody who's into sci-fi, you need to check out the Three-Body Trilogy by Sijin Liu. And Meditations would be my number one for many of the same reasons that Pat said. Like my uh, New Year's resolution last year was to read more books. So when I found a book club, that was a pretty good thing for me. <laughs> and then just getting in more into reading through Marcus Aurelius, Marcus Aurelius and the ideas of Stoicism really affected me a lot. So, And that eventually opened up to other dialogues of famous philosophers like Socrates. Mm-hmm. Which I'm sure we can all agree that that pretty much fried our brains after reading it. I think that was one of the more enjoyable ones that we did this year. Oh, since you brought it up, let me talk about my least favorite book, which was Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. And why yeah, is that, Will? Why is that? Oh, I don't know. How could you list the reasons you don't like Crime and Punishment? Well, probably because it was just garbage the whole way through. Oof. It was just it was just a fugue state of of depression and angst and confusion and failure and it was it it read like it felt that Rodia might have felt and I just didn't need to be exposed to that psychological churning of his brain for three hundred pages. Well, at least it wasn't eleven hundred pages, right? Yes, that is an interesting way to interpret things. <laughs> I'm glad I read it. I think everybody should read it. And I think that I liked reading it for the same reason I liked that I've read Catcher in the Rye, having read, reread it now. I think it's important for you to expose yourself to these things and have an opinion, even if your opinion, opinion is, oh, it's crap. Because you'll be able to laugh at your stupid opinion a few years out when you reread it and you realize you missed the major points of the book or, or the subtle points of the book even. Those can sneak up on you. But it's important to, to put the time in and, and read it so that you can have that opinion because then you get to have an opinion and opinions are so special, aren't they? Yeah, and I think those two books that you mentioned were kind of saying the same thing as Fight Club. But Fight Club, I think, is my favorite of those three. Between Catcher in the Rye, Crime and Punishment, I think Fight Club does a good job of portraying the how miserable a character can get, how confused. Crime and Punishment was more of a psychological look, like a realistic psychological look, whereas Fight Club was more like, like a punk rock, listening to a punk rock album or something like that. It's yeah, all it's very fun. And just learning about all the funny, the darkly humorous moments in that book. And even some of the ugly ones where you just realize, oh, wow, that actually does make sense. Is there more of this? It's weird that you would compare Fight Club and Crime and Punishment. I mean, it makes sense after you say it, but... Honestly, like I enjoyed Fight Club so darn much that to, to hear it compared to Crime and Punishment that way is, is kind of funny. Yeah, like going well, through just, Fight Club. Just in it the was way good. that the, just in the way that the the main character is just tortured by his own existence, kind of thing. No, oh, yeah, it, it makes total sense. Like I said, but I I wouldn't have thought it until 
uh, you'd already said it. And it's odd that I could enjoy something like that while hating something like Crime and Punishment so much. So did you have a least favorite book of the year, Patman? It would have to be Crime and Punishment. I have to go with Will on that. Oh, I mean, really? it was, yeah, it was part of Jordan Peterson's book list. I've read The Brothers Karamazov, and I was, that was the last book he wrote. And I guess maybe I should have started with his earlier ones before that, but I was actually entranced by Karamazov. And then I read Crime and Punishment. And, and while I did admire the psychology of the character and what he goes through, it was pretty much self-explanatory. I kept saying to myself, okay, it's simple. Don't kill people unless you want to be miserable for the rest of your life, if not suicidal. And just reading that, reading the parts where he kept dragging himself throughout this small little town, trying to hide all the evidence and being sick in this fever dream esque environment and just pure nihilism just it made me want to stop reading it but i couldn't and then i was glad that it was over like right when he was in the internment camps i was like okay we're done no more <laughs> oh we made it <laughs> yes either that or the divine comedy i mean oh. we all had a hard time with that Paradiso was a, a long one. Just I, Paradiso. I think for me, excluding Dante's Inferno, because that one was definitely really enjoyable. But for me, oh, it's yeah. probably a tie between Sapiens and the second two books of the Divine Comedy. The Sapiens was just like, I don't know, too atheist for me. And then Divine Comedy was just too Christian for me. <laughs> I really liked how Dante brought many inspirations of the biblical tales into Purgatorio and in the first the first book and um just how he manages to put together the descriptions of the settings was very entrancing and I thought for certain that after reading Paradiso I thought it was going to be one big acid trip <laughs> but really, it just got kind of meandering after a while. And I think the one book that may have an impact on the three of us, I don't know about you two, but for me, it would probably be the last book of the year, which was 12 Rules for Life. And reading each rule at a time and just carefully going through how Peterson sets up each chapter. and. I mean, they may sound self-explanatory, they may be easy, but once he references many historical events and biblical tales and referencing the Disney movies, the classic Disney movies, as well as his life as a psychologist, it definitely made me think a lot more broader about how life is, really, especially in today's society. What do you two think? Absolutely. Jordan Peterson definitely gets the honorable mention from my end. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. It, like, what a great book. I actually, so my copy of 12 Rules, I borrowed from my stepfather. And I think I borrowed it like a year and a half ago and never gave it back. So for Christmas, yeah. I got him a new copy of 12 Rules for Life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wholesome. Yeah, I was like, you're not getting your copy back. Thank you. <laughs> I've already bonded with this one. It's mine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was a really good book. I, I, I don't know why the first time I got into it, I had so much pretense about who Jordan Peterson was. But that was back when he was just starting to become a person in the limelight. <clears throat> and reading it the second time, I don't know what it is. I feel like maybe I need to just read every book I don't like a second time and make sure that I actually dislike it, or if there's just something else inside me that was getting called out that I, I missed. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to tell what your reasoning was in the past for liking or disliking something. 
all the time, especially with music. You ever listen to a song you think you loved and then you listen to it again? You're like, oh, this is this is an okay song. That's what it meant. (laughs) And the exact reverse. Like you hear something and you're like, this is garbage. And then you come back, you're like, hey, this ain't so bad. (laughs) It's pretty good, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I swear we filter things through the strangest filters. It's definitely not Brita. And what we get left with is is weird. Yeah, yeah definitely it. I guess it's because we're just we're just brought into the melodies, and then we don't pay attention to the lyrics much until years later that we read the lyrics and realize what it's about. I guess that's why I shifted towards lo-fi and classical lately. Speaking of lo-fi, little shout out to Akira the Dawn. And uh, my next question for you guys, what was the most influential or your favorite YouTuber or content creator that you found this year? Excluding Akira the Dawn, of course, because we all know he's number one on all our lists. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, he, I mean, he brought us together on the Discord and eventually made the book club, and here we are now. I think, honestly, as silly as I seem for saying it, Jocko Willink is one of the guys that I, I really got into this year. Like, I don't even think I'd heard of him before last January when I, I got exposed to him through Akira the Dawn. But, uh, yeah, he's he's fun. He's a powerful man's man, and he says some really good stuff. And his podcast format with Echo and just sort of those clips that he uploads that are just, here's one topic, here's me discussing it for 15 minutes, maybe even five minutes. That's been really wholesome and value added to my life, that's for sure. Yeah, definitely for me, uh, it it was definitely Jocko. And I guess now, after reading Can't Hurt Me, David Goggins is up there as well. It wasn't just because of his, I mean, he's, I'm sure he has a YouTube channel. I'm. I might be wrong on that because all I've seen were just like motivational videos of him talking, some lectures and everything. I'm sure he has one, but listening to him talk as well as reading his book was a divine revelation for me. Not because I wanted to do more, but just knowing that I can do more, that I'm actually capable of doing so. It's all a matter of just looking at your weaknesses and allowing suffering to be your friend. Yes, there is some resistance to that. I mean, nobody wants to suffer, of course, but suffering can be a lesson. And when you let suffering take hold of you temporarily, you will show your true strength. That's what I got out of Goggins and um, especially Jocko, too. I'm sure he mentioned a few times of um, going through turmoil and um, all that. But it was really good to hear from from leaders like them. What about yourself, Scott? Well, I have a, a few ideas being thrown around in my head, but I think the number one favorite of the year would be John Verveke. He's a university professor of cognitive science. And he does this uh, series, or he did this series on YouTube called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. I found that to be really useful. I still need to finish up on it, but yeah. What does he talk about? Everything, man. <laughs> like He starts out with like Plato, and then he just keeps going through you know, Aristotle and Marcus Aurelius, and then he talks about the Axial Revolution, and just just how to think properly, you know, like what a university is supposed to be learning how to think cognitive science and psychotechnologies, religion, mythology, stuff like that. I found him through a Christian pastor on YouTube named Paul Vanderclay, who I found like researching people talking about the Jordan Peterson Genesis lectures. So I started with Jordan Peterson watched the Genesis lectures. Then I found Paul Vanderclay, a Christian pastor who was analyzing them. And through him, I found this other guy that Jordan Peterson was working with named John Verveke doing a lot of the same kind of stuff. 
And like just the fact that he put a label to it, the meaning crisis, I just found to be incredibly useful. Yeah, definitely, because it can be easy to lose your way and just fall into this this sort of crowd mentality of, oh, woe is me. I'm not going to get everywhere, so therefore I'm going to bash everyone and everything just to get just to get a rise out of people and, you know, all that. Yeah, and he also talks about how religion can be super useful for people in this kind of problem. Like, it's not by any means the only way out. He talks a lot about Buddhism and uh, meditation, all that good stuff. Tai Chi. I think I'd like to see Akira the Dawn do a little remix or two of John Verveke's videos. So what do you look forward to as far as the book wave goes in the new year? I mean, obviously there's some stuff that we can't talk about, but just, but just for, you know, verbatim, like, what, can what do you like to see about? happen? I'm so excited for our first few books this year. Just getting into the foundational texts. Is that what you're referring the to? The foundational man? texts. Oh, man, the two of them, Greek and Western. Oh, boy, it's going to be a good couple. Western, Eastern, Northern, Southern, whatever we can get our grubby little fingers on. <laughs> Fire, air, water, earth. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be it's gonna be a good year. It, I'm, it's Pat, am I not allowed to spoil this? I'm excited to read the Bible. Like, this is going to be crazy. I mean, it's out there, so anything is but possible. Let the world judge as they will. It is out there for them to see it. Yeah, like, I don't know, especially over the past year, like, I, I think I became a lot less critical of, of modern religion and Christianity as a whole. I think my opinion that's been developing of, of religion over the past few years is simply it was a very good intention thing, and as with all good intention things, human inter interpretation has been its destruction. But that doesn't mean... There isn't value there, and there aren't lessons to be learned there. And I'm excited to actually take the the time to to understand, digest, and assimilate that knowledge into my life. What if it takes us more than a year to get through it? Then that's what happens. And, so and we <laughs> throw books in in the middle, and we have a very meaningful podcast for over a year. Yep. I'm especially looking forward to reading some Japanese literature because I've been very fascinated at the aesthetics and philosophy of Japanese literature. I've gotten a few books from several Japanese authors that I like to look forward to, to reading. Because to me, we, we've read The Art of War, which was another great book on the podcast. and. Um, the way that it was presented, it offered humility and harmony. And I think that striving for those two things in the realms of Japanese literature is, can make a great impact. So there's some, there's some books that I've, that I've got on hand. So, uh, one of them is like a collection of poems and haikus written by... Zen monks as they lay dying, having their last few days on earth, just reciting some beautiful poetry and just learning about what they are about. There's also a story about a traveling cat and his master and, and just uh, several classics too that I have on hand. It'll be very interesting to go through. But yeah, well, um, just it'll be very interesting to go through the Bible, especially the New Testament, because there may be some things in the Bible that are often overlooked and not taking a huge time to actually go over and kind of study carefully, like the letters of Paul or the four apostles or the book of Proverbs. It, it'll be interesting to go through. I can only agree profusely as I am completely uneducated in the structure, contents, and message and meaning behind the Bible. I, I skipped Bible school 
I skipped Sunday school. I didn't go to church. I have almost zero information to go on if we want to talk about the Bible ahead of time. I'm almost done reading the book of Job. The book of Job was good. I'm excited for the Old Testament more so than the New. The, the older it gets, the, the more intrigued I am. So we'll see. It, it's going to be a good mix. Yeah, I'm definitely excited for the Bible. Get into some Hemingway too. That'll be good. Yeah, we've got a good year planned. Is there any major talking points that I'm missing? What else are we discussing today? I think we pretty much covered everything so far. Um, just know that, you know, we have a big year ahead of us and we have a lot of plans to improve the podcast and offer more exciting content for book lovers of all types. And um, just stay tuned. And you can check us out at our website at bookwave.club. May the force be with you. Or equal to times max acceleration or something like that. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how it goes, Will. (laughs) Uh, Here's the 2020. Wubba lubba dub dub. Yeah.